The vetting of 36 ministerial nominees appointed by President Kufuado to serve in his administration has commenced. Now, four key people took their turn today. I'm talking about Senior Minister Designate Yao Safomafo, Albert Kandapa for National Security, Kano Furiata for Finance, and Dominic Nisiwo for Defense. In fact, Dominic Nisiwo is still being interrogated in Parliament right now. A lot of insights we've seen from these <coughs> nominees and what they seek to bring on board to reform, especially the country's economy. These are the issues that will drive our discussions today on PM Express. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. I'll be sitting in for your usual host. And when I come back, I have some fine brains who have all the answers to the numerous questions bugging your minds. They will help me delve into these matters. This is PM Express. Stay tuned. Welcome back. This is PM Express, and you're watching us live from our studios in Kokomlimle, Accra. We are also live via channel 421 on DSTV and on GoTV. I have two doctors tonight who will be doing the discussions. One of them with me in the studio, a luminary, when it comes to um, political and governance issues. And he is no other than Dr. Bosman Asari. He's with the Political Science Department of the University of Ghana. Doctor, you're welcome to PM Express. Thank you. And Thank the you other much. doctor will be joining us via Skype. Dr. Lord Mensah is a senior lecturer at the University of Ghana's Business School. Uh, good evening to you, Doc, if you're already on. And thanks for joining us on PM Express. All right. Uh, Doc will join us very soon. Okay, Doc, so I'm seeing you on my screens. Welcome to PM Express. All right, Doc seems to be, uh, he's now picking up his signal. He'll put himself together and join us. Let me start from the studio quickly, uh, Doc. You've been following the vetting procedure today. Have been listened to all four persons. I know the last person is still being vetted. Um, you've listened to Yao Osafu Mafo. He had a very long uh, interrogation by members of parliament. You've listened to uh, Mr. Keno Furiata. Uh, a while ago, uh, they just finished with him, and you've also listened to Albert Kandapa. Having listened to all of them, how would you describe their personalities? Uh, let me uh, start by saying good evening to our viewers and if there are listeners. Uh, let me admit that these are individuals who appear to be very, very knowledgeable. You look at uh, someone like uh, Mr. Safumafo, he appears to have all the information, he appears to know what we can do as a country to be able to make the necessary leap or the necessary step forward. So without uh, wasting much time, let me admit that these are people who are very, very knowledgeable. You look at their backgrounds, their experiences in life, I think that we can say Ghanaians are going to get value for money. The thing no, that normally happens in politics is that at times people will say a lot of things, but when it comes to the reality, we don't get a lot of things done. But to be frank with them today, They've made a lot of points and they've sent a clear signal to the Ghanaian people that these are the men for the job they have been given. Uh, let's talk about uh, Mr. Yao Osafomafo. He started, he was the one who began the whole procedure. Uh, indeed, a lot of revelations we had from him. Um, first, uh, what he says is that his, his position, he tried to clear the, uh, uh, you know, there have been some controversies about what he seeks to do as a senior minister. And he says that he is going to be uh, a supervisor uh, to the finance ministry and also coordinate with the, uh, the other ministries. Um, how does all of these come to you? And do you also foresee uh, a duplication of duties as uh, some people have um, have shown concern or have expressed concern that uh, his position may be uh, a worry to the finance ministry? Well, uh, certainly you are going to have some element of uh, duplication in there. Well, we know Osafu Mafu, although he's an engineer, many Ghanaians have come to identify him as an economic guru. 
Apart from that, you have someone like Mr. Keno Foriata, who is a well-known expert in that area. You have someone even like Mr. Lancha at the Trade Ministry. You also have uh, the Vice President of the Republic, who is also well-known in the economic arena. And we even have uh, Dr. Antonio Akuto. Or say all these individuals are very, very important. But I think the President has made it very clear that he is creating a certain layer. And that layer, you need someone who is a very senior, someone who is highly respected within the cycles of economic management. And Mr. Safmafu made it very clear that his job is to be to coordinate the economic activities of the various ministries. And when you take it from that particular perspective, although duplication will be in there, the main thing is that Ghanaians are thinking about economic development. Ghanaians are thinking about economic transformation. I know initially we had issues with people, the designation of the senior minister, etc. But I think for most Ghanaians, they are looking forward to a team that will be able to bring transformation that has been elusive for so many years. So once he's going to function as a coordinator, etc., Ghanaians are looking forward to that transformation. We know the chief of staff is normally supposed to even uh, engage in some of this coordination. Exactly. But what this administration is trying to do is that let, let's leave the chief of staff to focus on certain activities, especially the individuals working in the presidency and other ministries. But when it comes to the economy, which is the main problem Ghana we are facing as a country, let's get someone who is a senior person and can serve as an additional avenue for policy change, for policy implementation for the government. All right, so I think it will be very um, appropriate to listen to Yawa Safomafo and some of the submissions he made today to the Appointment Committee of Parliament to have a better conversation. As you are referring profusely to the Constitution, may I take your indulgence to also read Article 78.2. With your permission, Mr. Chairman, Article 78.2 reads, The President shall appoint such number of ministers of state as may be necessary for the efficient, and I'm emphasizing efficient, running of the state. The president has the prerogative to appoint these ministers. As you naming, you decide to call an octopus minister, octopus minister. I mean, the only one minister is mentioned in this constitution of ours, and that's the attorney general. In other clauses, further ministers have been mentioned, finance, interior, and defense under the security, because they are members of the security council. Now, I'm certainly Minister of State. His Excellency the President, in his wisdom, defined my work and decided that I should be called Senior Minister because I have a coordinating role to play. And this is not the first time. J.H. Mensah did the same. Uh, knowing the kind of experience J.H. Mensah had, and I can assure you, J.H. Mensah had a tremendous influence on our performance as a government. So I think. I will not answer questions raised on finance. It will be answered by the Minister of Finance. I told you I'm doing a coordinating role. If you want to ask questions related to coordination, I will come and answer that. So the simple answer is that you are not superior to any minister. You are equal to all them. You are co-equal to all the ministers, if I may use that uh, expression. I'm a minister who is also a coordinator. And in coordinating, you could also flex muscles here and there for information. <laughs> you are coordinating, you need to collect data, you need to match things, and you can't just sit. And if you ask figures, if you set targets and people don't bring, wouldn't you request and insist on them? Is, uh, no, I ask a specific question. As a minister of state under Article 78, whether you are co-equal to all your colleague ministers or you are superior in ranking to them, and you said you are a minister who is coordinating and because of that you can flex your muscles what kind of muscles can you flex because you are all equal <laughs> if you ask somebody we need data to do certain things to do analysis and if you ask somebody to bring the data and the data is not coming what will you do if you are coordinating you must find a way of getting that information and you must give him or her a deadline that I want this information, but otherwise we can't run the system. The system must be run with some discipline in it, wouldn't it? 
Won't you think so? If you are coordinating and whatever you ask, it doesn't come, what will you do? You sit down and look into the air? I think I have to literally have some guidelines. So far, in the transition, I'm doing the same and I haven't had any problem with anybody. People are so ready to make sure that we, we are singing on the same hymn sheet. We want to achieve economic transformation. And that, that calls some efforts, that calls for some discipline, that calls for an analysis. Analysis can only be done with figures. And if the figures are with you and you won't bring it, shouldn't we take steps to get them from you? Um, Mr. Chairman, I think um, when at least I look at our current state of public finances, um, I suspect we need um, tighter monitoring and control, and I don't think that would hurt. Um, if we can do this, we might never need the IMF. Um, I just so I am convinced that it will be helpful and not take away from um, making the act that Parliament has passed um, stronger in execution. Thank you. The party manifesto proposes to abolish a number of taxes, reducing the corporate tax, removing import duties on raw materials and machinery for production, abolishing the special import levy, abolishing the 17.5 VAT on imported medicines not produced in the country, abolishing the 17.5% VAT on financial services, abolishing the 5% VAT on real estate sales, abolishing the 17.5% VAT on domestic airline tickets, reducing VAT for micro and small enterprises, and then imposing a 3% flat. Uh, in, that was introduced previously by the Kufo-led MPP government. I look at all these taxes and it is taxes that are normally paid by people in a certain economic category. And you are proposing to take away those taxes and leave, because people of a certain class enjoy certain services. And you are leaving the general VAT on goods, which is largely consumed by poor people and people of a certain lower social standing. And uh, before you came a nominee for the post of senior minister, and he said the tax base will expand, which in my opinion meant that broadened, which in my opinion meant that many of the poor people in the informal sector who have somehow been escaping paying taxes will all be roped in. Um, this, these taxes, will you admit, will further deepen the divide between the rich and the poor, and make the rich richer, and then the poor poorer by imposing more economic burdens on, on them. And lastly, if you take out these taxes, have you remember, considered the, remember, have you considered the, let the, let the financial answer. implications? Have you calculated please answer the first part of the question? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Honourable Member, I, I don't consider uh, this tax to be regressive or aimed at um, the poor uh, to make them worse off. I, I've never actually thought about that. I think what I worry about with the poor is how we can continue um, to have such egregious poverty in this country. And um, what is the best way um, to be able to ensure 
um, that we up the living standards of everyone. Um, I think as a party, uh, I have seen keen interest in education and national health, and I will not presume um, that the underlying uh, trigger for this uh, is to make them worse off. I think the issue of paying taxes is something that we all have to do as citizens, and it is important um, that we all recognize the responsibility of citizenhood. Uh, but at the same time, if we look at the totality of the manifesto, um, I think we would agree that there's quite a bit of stimulus that we are redirecting um, to the ground. As Welcome to PM Express. Many thanks for choosing us. But you've been listening to some of the people who were vetted today. Uh, Yawa Safumafo was the one who took a stand first, and then we've just seen Ken Oferiata answering to some questions relating to our economy. Joining us via phone, because we are trying to resolve our Skype, we're having issues with signal. But Dr. Lord Mensah, uh, he's a senior lecturer uh, at the University of Ghana Business School. He joins us via phone. Good evening to you, uh, Dr. Lord Mensah. Many thanks for joining us on PM Express. Hello, uh, Dr. Lord Mensah. If you can hear me, Welcome to PM Express. Yes, um, thank you, Aisha, and thank you to our viewers. Well, so one of the interesting accolades uh, we've seen today uh, in the uh, things that uh, Osafo Mafo has been telling the vetting committee or the uh, appointments committee of parliament is the fact that. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Aisha, and thank you. Hello, hello, Dr. Menza. Yeah. Hello, Aisha, I'm listening. Okay, so one of the yeah. interesting things we've seen Dr. S uh, Mr. Safo Mafo telling the uh, Appointments Committee of Parliament is the fact that um, we need to um, take taxes because the um, Ekufuado led government promised that they were going to reduce taxes. And of course, he says that, yes, we promised that we're going to reduce taxes, but yes, we'll also be taking taxes. It doesn't mean that we're taking off taxes at all, but we'll take taxes, we'll charge taxes, but we'll do it strategically. The question I ask, what is the meaning of being strategic? I mean, how strategic can you be? You're taking taxes, you're taking taxes. There's nothing like you're taking taxes and you're being strategic about it. Yes, um, thank you very much, uh for giving me the opportunity. I think um, if you look at taxes, uh, it depends on when you implement the tax. Now, if you take the corporations or the corporate level, if you, if you implement the tax at the corporate level, it has a way of you know, uh, reducing the returns after tax of, of, of the corporation. So therefore, there's no, there will be no room for expansion. But then if you reposition it, in such a way that you reduce the taxes at that corporate level where the corporate entities will be able to retain more and then reinvest, it calls for expansion. Now, with this expansion, I'm expecting that they will expand with people. And definitely, if they are expanding with people, it's going to create employment. Now, if you create employment, it turns out that every single person that is employed will be paying tax. So it's a way of repositioning the tax. You're trying to say that corporate entities will have their tax holidays. In the end, you expect reinvestment into the firm so that the firm grows up. When it's growing up, we expect that it will grow with people and it will create employment. Then you can earn more taxes from employment. That is when people earn their salaries. You try to tax them. So you realize that you strategically shifted the taxes from the corporate level to the individual level. So in this case, um, it's a way of expanding the economy. Remember last year's election that we went into was about, a, was about employment. So we're looking out for government that will create employment for individuals, employment for backlogs of graduates that has not been employed. So if they reposition the taxes, I think it's the best thing Ghanaians can get from that. But and you talk of shifting is, the taxes. Is, you talk of shifting the taxes from the corporate level to the individual level. Yes. That will hurt a lot of people, isn't it? No, it won't hurt a lot of people. If the people are 
gainfully employed, taxes are nothing to write about. It's about getting a good job and then paying your taxes. Now, if you're earning and then a percentage of it is going into the government tax coffers, and then we see what the taxes are doing, I don't think Ghanaians will complain. But it shouldn't be a situation where we scuffle or we hold the neck of the companies, we take the app, we take them taxes, and the leeway to expand becomes a problem. So therefore, they crumble and then they cannot get access to, sorry, they cannot expand. And then employing people becomes difficult. So um, if um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Yasafumafo is saying that they're going to reposition or strategically going to implement taxes, I think one of the approaches will be like that. Now, that is more or less taking it from the bottom. So we call it bottom-up approach. Now, the earlier on approach was um, top-down approach. That is taxing from the corporate level and then allowing the corporations to shrink and then you're not allowing them to expand and therefore you create unemployment situations. And they also have a policy which says that um, they're going to empower the private sector. Now, empowering the private sector, one of the ways you can go about it is to reduce taxes and then also make sure that the macroeconomic environment becomes serene. But and one of the biggest questions people have asked is reducing taxes. How does government generate revenue for other purposes? That's very, a very good question. Reducing taxes does not mean that taxes will not come in. Definitely, there's going to be taxes. Now, if you look at our tax structure, the biggest one that you take is the, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, is the employment taxes. That is labor tax, okay? That is the biggest chunk of all. Now, I think they have studied the system and they've realized that if they block all the leakages in the system compared to the taxes that they call the nuisance taxes, that is taxes that are shrinking businesses, presumably, I think there is an opportunity there for them to gain more if they take off those taxes and then make sure they block the leakages. So the revenue, I believe, I mean, will come in if they block all the leakages that we have in the country. Uh, let's look at one other interesting thing that we had uh, Mr. Asafo Mafo say this afternoon, that the IMF uh, deal will definitely be reviewed by the MPP government. And he gives two reasons for that. He says that Yakufu uh, Adu has the... Um, he, he has the vision of creating fiscal space. And currently, he feels that there is no fiscal space. And this is one of the reasons why the IMF deal will be reviewed. Um, does, is it necessary for the uh, IMF deal to be re reviewed? Well, I, my position on the IMF deal has always been one way. For me, it's a program we went into it as a country. A country, we have a history. And the history has been that we were not financially disciplined. And then we positioned ourselves into debt. So, therefore, at the end of the day, we needed a rescue. Now, the rescue has come in. I presume that we should allow the rescue to mature. Now, this IMF program, if you look at the timelines, will end somewhere in June. Now, the benefit that we're supposed to get as a result of staying fiscal discipline, um, we're now realizing some of the benefits. And um, for me, it will be premature to go and then um, just um, overhaul the whole um, agreement or the whole relationship. But then, if they are to negotiate some part of it, I won't have a problem to do that. For instance, allowing our fiscal, uh, what do you call it, uh, deficit to be around 5.2%, which the IMF is pushing for, um, for me, it will not give the government the leeway to do some of the developmental plans that they have or they stated in their manifesto. So if that is the bit that they are going to renegotiate, try to lift it up a bit so that at the end of the day, there will be a bit of gap between um, revenue and then expenditure. I think it will give the government the briefing space to uh, implement its project or its, its um, um, uh, policies that it promised Ghanaians. So if that is the part that they are going to renegotiate for, I think uh, I go with it. Other than that, the part that says um, the central bank, sorry, the government should stay um, zero, um, uh, uh, zero finance with the central bank, I presume that um, that one, they can take it bit by bit. That they can also look at it and say, fine, we can do the zero financing, but uh, it might not be immediate. We can take it gradually. Every year we reduce it by one percentage margin. And then say, for about five years, 
we can now it's about five it's about five percent because if the government is a, that was when um, the incumbent and the opposition last year put it because earlier on it was ten percent now with a ten percent means that every revenue that the uh, government is expecting it can pre-finance that uh, ten percent of it from the central bank now they put it at the IMF was looking out for zero percent the reason why they were looking out for zero percent is that they thought that pre-financing has been causing our inflation to stay up. So by that time, the opposition, which is the current administration, and then the incumbent, which was the um, uh, NDC government, in parliament realized that it's not feasible because the government needs my, will need money to, uh, you know, implement its policy, start implementing its policy. So they pegged it at 5%. The 5%, I think the IMF came in for review and possibly they were not satisfied. Because uh, we've been enjoying some free fish that pre-financing for over decades now. And for you to come in and say we should halt it abruptly, I think it's non-negotiable. So it, they, were not, they were not being fair to us. So I think they can look at it this way. Every year they can reduce it. It would take them about five years to do that. And by that time, I, I presume, with prudent management um, and then also avoiding, you know, those possible leakages, um, the economy will have its footing. And in the end, revenue generation wouldn't be a problem. So we can go by the zero financing. Well, there's another huge debate I'll have you hold, and that's uh, on borrowing. Uh, we've heard Osafu Mafo talk about uh, how his government will borrow. But we'll, I'll have you hold and come back to the studio and speak with Dr. Botman Asari. Uh, one interesting thing I also heard uh, Osafu Mafo speak about is the fact that he's not interested in a 40-year development plan. He feels that rather we should have a 10-year development plan. I mean, what's your stance on this? And if a 40-year plan is not good for Ghana, how would a 10-year plan be better for Ghana? I, I think when you look at many countries that have gone through some of these uh, development plans and development agendas, uh, the plan has always been, some of them think in the short term, can we do something for five years, then after the five years, we make some adjustment. And in Ghana's case, we decided we wanted a 40-year development plan. Probably because we've had lack of planning for a very for long, long time, time, so a lot of things are messed up. Yes. I think, I, to some extent, I agree with Mr. Osafumaf, but the general issue has to do with the fact that whether it's 40 years or, or it's 10 years, the main thing is that we need the political will. Once it's 40 years, what can we do so that we can realize the objectives of that particular 40 years? And you know, when you look at the angle Mr. Osafumaf was coming from, if we are not very careful, there will be a 40-year development plan, and after 10 years, certain provisions or certain objectives within the plan may not necessarily be so relevant. So there is the need to make some changes. So when you even have something like five years or 10 years, that means the time will come and as a country, you realize that certain things can be done for us to change. For example, we had uh, Mr. Foriata talking about the taxes. Uh, what can we do to bring uh, the grassroots, many people on board to pay the taxes? We can do that as a country. But after five years, when we realize that we've been able to widen the tax base, we've gotten several people, then we'll change the focus of taxation. So I think that whether it's 10 years or it's 40 years, it's not something we should be so much uh, debating or disagreeing about. The main thing is the political will. If it's 40 years, the current administration, what are you doing? Your part will be if you have four years or you have eight years. What are you doing to be able to realize or achieve something which will make it easier for us to achieve that comprehensive objective of the development plan? But we can have this 10-year as a medium term and have a 40-year plan as a long term. Yes. Now I, which, which is done in several parts of the world. But the reality is that you don't want a situation whereby something which is 40 years. We know the unpredictability of the global economy you can plan for 10 years by two years you realize that you will not be able to achieve that so as you said we can have the 40 year will be there if you like the universal set but the i long -term think exactly objective. that's what the ndc government did uh, why is it wrong now that the npp government is in you know, power we, we need to understand that we live in a country where we have two dominant political parties and the parties always to want to appear to be different although most of us political watchers believe that they are not so different from each other. So you can see that the same thing which is being done by this party, another party would like to find what can we do 
differently. That's why I was hearing um, uh, Mr. Safmafu talking about the need to renegotiate the IMF deal. The IMF recognizes that once you have uh, won political uh, power or if you like political capital, you have made some promises to the people. Yeah. So you want to accomplish, you want to be able to do uh, some of the provisions or the promises. And you know the IMF, apart from being an economic institution, is also a political organization. So they understand that once you are a government, we have the program of the previous government that you make sure you do A, B, C, and D. But once a new party or a new government has come in, it's a clear indication that the people were not happy with the previous administration. Right. So the IMF will be open to look at it from a certain angle. But that doesn't mean the whole IMF program is not good. But because there are different parties, they always want to look at things from different angles. All right. Um, but uh, if you look at uh, the way the NPP is tackling the issue, uh, we know that in this we've never had a, a development plan. And this is something that all of us should embrace. If NPP government says we're reducing it to 10 years uh, because they don't believe in 40 years, come on. You and I know that 10 years is too short a time to be able to develop Ghana the way it is now. I think, uh, in terms of we have, have not had uh, development, I know we've had I remember Kwame Nkrumah, we had a seven-year development plan, but the National Development Planning Commission was talking about the need for a long-term national objective. Exactly which so. Will, which will bind the different political parties once you are in government, right. which is not so different from even the 10 years the MPP or the five years they are talking about. But is it feasible? No, I think it is. Whichever way, the 40 years is feasible, so is the 10 years or the five years. The main thing is that when at times when it is a short plan, you want to make sure what can we do. It doesn't mean after the 10 years you will not make another step forward. Right. Let's look at a country like Ghana. We know that we are in a, a lower middle income. So many years ago, we are so stuck in the lower, far, far, uh, one of the poorest in, within the, in terms of the per capita income. But now we've made some progress. So as a country, we can decide that in the next five years, we want to ensure that we get to this level. After that, we come up with another particular program and that will still amount to the same four years but 40 years but as i said you have different political parties and they appear to look at things from different Angle. angles and when you look at even the taxation the way mr foriata was talking about it the mpp philosophy is that let's widen the base and ensure that many people who have not been paying the taxes they are captured all the leakages in the system but the ndc approach is also let's make sure that we tax those at the top and let's free those at the bottom and when you go to the u.s is the same thing which applies the democrats are saying that let's charge the corporations the republicans are saying that let's look at how we can give some freedoms to the corporations so that they can create more employment opportunities and when you look at what mr foriata was saying the idea was that if you can reduce the taxes on businesses etc these individuals will be inspired to create more opportunities but the flip side is that there is what is called pain imposition. If you are not very careful, you may end up imposing or imposing a lot of pain on ordinary people who are making 300 Ghana Exactly Ganassi, the point a lot of Ganassi. people are making. Mm. And so I think we need to be careful the way we handle these issues because we may decide to um, repair one and rather end up in, um, hurting the other yeah. person. Yeah. Um, Dr. Lord Mensa is still on the uh, is on Skype with us. Doc, if you can hear me, we heard the MPP government criticizing, yes, I can hear you, Aisha. chastising the NDC government for borrowing heavily, which they say was so, so inappropriate. Today, we heard Yao Osafomafo saying, we're not saying we are not borrowing. We will borrow, but we'll do it differently. Hello. Differently. How do we borrow and differently? Don't you agree with people who think that, listen, borrowing is borrowing. There is no way you can borrow and make it look different. Yes, Aisha, um, you can borrow and make it look different. There are so many ways you can borrow and make it look different. Let's, let's, let's take this scenario. A situation where somebody has entrusted his funds with you, and then the funds comes into your bosom, and then you have the incentive to I mean, place the money anyway, anyhow, and then not necessarily be ready to pay the person back with an interest rate on it. So when it happens like that, any time the person's interest rate gets mature that you're supposed to pay, you end up borrowing again to pay. That was the cycle Ghana was going through. Now, if uh, Mr. Yosef Manfu is saying that 
uh, we're going to borrow, I mean, a call for it. Remember, some debts that were incurred earlier, years, are not going to mature. Now, how do you finance those maturities? You have to borrow to finance them because your, the money that you, borrow, you borrowed earlier has not been placed in such a way that it will be able to pay back the, uh, what do you call it, the principles that were at stake at the same time, the interest that comes with it. So definitely we have to borrow. Now, we also have to borrow to grow. Now, you know we are a developing country. The appetite for growth is there. Just that for me, my advice would be that we need to slow it down a bit and see how we can plug in other things to ensure that the local level is handled very well, looking at the employment aspect of it. So I would say that definitely we need to borrow. But then you can borrow wisely. Now, borrowing wisely means that you have to make sure that you negotiate for proper interest rates. You're negotiating for proper interest rates, you can package yourself nicely and say that, hey, these are the indicators in my economy. But you don't go to market when the market is not favorable. At the same time, too, the indicators in your economy are not favorable. Every investor will penalize you for that situation. Because if you, are, if you package yourself to say that I'm coming to borrow to redeem old debt, obviously you should expect higher interest rates. If you are going to borrow and then your debt level is also high, you should expect that you will pay higher interest. Indeed, so, our Safoma talks about servicing debt quickly. How does that rescue uh, the NPP government uh, from borrowing differently? Well, like I said, borrowing differently can come in different forms. Now, if you borrow, you know the quantum of money. Because anytime you are going to the market to borrow, remember, the, the freebies that we were enjoying as a, uh, what do you call it, a poor country as of those times, are no more. Now we're borrowing from the international market, which is purely commercial. So nobody is going to, you know, put you in hippie and say that your your debt has your debt has been trapped. We are going to pay and pay with interest. So anytime it's six months, one year that we're supposed to pay our interest, money has to be available to pay those interests. So trust me, we need to borrow, but we need to borrow wisely. We've had serious blunders in this country where we borrow. In the end, we borrow and then come and start the excesses in the government account, which sometimes we don't know what the monies are doing. So we've had situations where monies were lying idle, where managers think they can what? Divert the money into an account somewhere to make some interest on it. It doesn't make sense. If you are borrowing, you borrow purposefully. You went for the money. That is why investor would entrust his funds into your hands and know that, hey, this money that I've given Ghanaians, the monies are going to do this kind of job. You don't borrow in assets. Make sure you match the quantum of your liabilities to the funds that you're going to borrow. So at the end of the day, there will be no excesses, there will be no you know, waste in the system. That is one way of what? Borrowing wisely, okay? Indicating what you are coming to use the money for and then make sure that you match exactly the quantum of money that you need to the, um, the project or whatever obligations that it needs to satisfy. Now, the second part is to make sure that you match up the duration. Matching up the duration means that you are going to borrow, you are coming to invest the money into projects, you are coming to use the money for a purpose. Now, the, those purposes have what? Cash flows, which you think those cash flows can satisfy that, this debt obligation. Now, you don't go and borrow 10 years and come and put the money into projects that can take you about 30 years to realize cash flows. That is what? Duration mismatching. So it becomes a problem when you need money to satisfy your debt obligation. Because by the time the 10 years is due, the 30 years is not there to come and satisfy. So we need to, that is the wise way of what? Borrowing. And I remember um, the president's delivery of his address during his inauguration, he mentioned that he's going to protect the national affairs by ensuring what? Value for money in all projects. And if they should go by this way, I think the debt that we incurred from now on, I think in the future, in the next four years, in the next five years, we should be able to realize meaningful cash 
to go and satisfy those uh, debt obligations. Let's so, look at the personality of uh, Ken Foriata, who is the finance minister designate. Uh, we heard him this afternoon when he was uh, being vetted by parliament. But a lot of people have raised concerns about he himself, his calmness, and they feel that this could hurt the job. Is it a requirement to do a better job? Well, for me, you don't need any aggression to go ahead into to be a finance minister. You know, we're talking about somebody who has been in the private sector, someone who is a, an investment banker. I've heard people saying that he's, um, he's not under any public position before, so therefore the experience as far as the public sector is con concerned um, is not there. I, I, will, I, I bet to differ on that. What is the difference between the public sector and then the corporate Ghana as we speak now? A corporate Ghana that can go on euro bond market and borrow, okay? The same thing that the corporations does. The market that we borrow from is the same market that, you know, uh, what do you call it? The same market that you can pick corporate entities also borrowing um, on the same platform. So why should we say that this person who has been managing corporate entities into what? Their success will not be able to manage a country like Ghana. Let's look, Ghana, let's look at Ghana as a corporate Ghana, where now we've attained that lower middle income stature, which comes with responsibility, which comes with no more freebie, no more grant, which, <laughs> which is telling you that anything you borrow or whatever funds you raise, okay, you should be able to use it wisely. So in the end, we are looking at someone who understands investment. Okay. But let's investment. look at him as he was explaining how he intends to deal with this economy. We know our interest rates are not anything good to go by. Uh, they are so high, he wants to deal with that. He wants to deal with the ballooning debt. He wants to deal with some leakages. He wants to seal all those leakages. All of these he wants to do as he comes in as finance minister. Is it an easy task, especially in the kind of economy we find ourselves now? Well, it, it will, it, it, you, can, you, you classify it to be whether an easy task or um, a difficult task, depending on the time lapse that you want him to solve this problem. If you are Remember, Ghanaians do not have the patience because I, they, I, they, I, uh, that's I, why I, they actually gave the mandate to the NPP government. I, I understand that bit of it. But then Ghanaians should also know that to achieve macro-level targets, they don't come overnight. They don't come overnight in a sense that some structures that were put in place earlier are sometimes yielding material, uh, yielding pro profit or the dividends are coming up now. Sometimes some of the structures they will put in place, the benefit will not come to the administration as we speak now. So Ghanaian should exercise patience. If he is saying that he's going to plot leakages, he's going to make sure that he reduces taxes, he's going to make sure that interest rate comes down, I think he can do it over time. If you look at four years and above, it's achievable. Right? If you look at it in a short term, which is within a year, within a year, some of the achievements can come up. If you take, for instance, removal of those news and taxes, I think it's a matter of sitting down and looking, doing some cost-efficient analysis and realizing that, fine, if I tax too much, it's going to create employment. If I tax too much, it's going to create unemployment. In the end, this is the cost of unemployment in this country, including all the social vices. And then also, you look at the benefit that will come to you if you should what? You know, cut down the taxes and then allow corporations or entities to, you know, have their way of expanding. And then you transfer the taxes to individuals. I presume that you have to do the analysis to realize that. And it doesn't come overnight. So I'm hopeful that um, we will exercise patience as Ghanaians and give the administration some time to settle. Well, many thanks to you, Dr. Lord Mensa. We're extremely grateful for your time on PM Express uh, this evening. But one other issue that featured prominently when Albert Kandapa took his turn were security issues. Um, one of them had to do with the sale of the drill ship. Um, let's listen to Mr. Kandapa and then we can uh, analyze that. Uh, no such committee was set up to, to sell 
the drill uh, ship. What happened was that an, there was an attempt to settle with the company that we were owing. A, a, com a committee was set up to do that negotiation. I do know that they did have some meetings, but before they could come up with a final report, the company that we were owing had been able to obtain judgment, and at that point, they were not willing to negotiate any further. So not much came out of that uh, committee. I have heard the honorable member, uh, Dr. Gambilla, saying that he did not remember serving on that uh, committee. Uh, obviously, we have to check from the records at the ministry. He was a member if what he meant was that he had not been able to attend any of the meetings, that probably uh, is uh, another issue altogether. But yes, a, com a committee was set up, and he was supposed to be a member of that uh, committee. The outcome of the committee's work, to me, is not that important, because as I said, uh, before they had been able to conclude their work, the uh, Société General had been able to obtain a court judgment. and. Why will they negotiate when the court has said you must pay them this amount? So that was Albert Kandapa trying to uh, respond to some questions regarding the sale of the drill ship. But the personality Kandapa, we have seen him around. It's become a household name. He's occupied a lot of positions. The last one was the uh, Public Accounts Committee, which he chaired. Uh, we know what he brings on board. but. He's going into a very sensitive position. He's going to be minister in charge of what? National, National security. security. And we know how the leakages we have with security in our country. Um, does he have what it takes? In, in listening to him today, what do you think? Uh, is he fit for the position? No, I, I think, uh, frankly speaking, he has uh, that personality. He has that particular profile. He's been uh, mi a minister, several ministries, interior, defense, uh, and apart from that, a public accounts committee chairperson. So you, you see him as someone who really understands what it means to be in public service. And one thing also about security is that you want to make sure that you have someone who is very, very intelligent. And when you look at the description that was uh, given by the president of the republic, he said uh, something about intelligence. We need someone who can be held accountable when there are security breaches, someone who will be very relevant when it comes to intelligence gathering. How do we support the various security agencies? And now we live in a world, the world has been very dangerous, more dangerous than in the past. We know what is happening in Nigeria, what is happening in Mali, Ivory Coast, with the activities of terrorists. So you want to make sure that your national security minister is someone who really understands what it means to gather intelligence. And apart from that, you also want to make sure that this is someone who understands human rights. We know the activities of the police in Ghana. We, not, and we hear of the military, uh, human rights violations. So if you can have someone who can ensure that these individuals, these agencies are doing their work very, very well, I think it will bode well for the Ghanaian people. So I think that is the type who can really do the work. And when you look at how the vetting has started, it's a clear indication that if even you have the people who are going to support your nomination, you must be seen to be doing your work very, very well. Because if you don't do it very well and you appear before the committee in future, they are going to ask you questions about the things you did when you were in office some many, many years ago. So I know all of them are learning from it, uh, Mr. Safuma, et cetera, to make sure that they leave an indelible imprint in the minds of the Ghanaian people. But you know that his position also has brought some controversies. Of course, indeed, legally, it is prescribed by the Constitution yes. that we should have a minister in charge of this. But uh, if you look at the Minister for Interior, and then we have Minister for Defense, now we have Minister for National Security, people feel that there could be some overlaps. Well, I think these overlaps are there. Even when you look at the trade, uh, the finance, most of the ministries we are going to have. But the key thing is that the appointing authority would define your roles. In the past, we didn't have minister for national security, at least in the administration that just left office. But now we have it. So what that means is that we expect the president, which he did 
uh, almost last week or two weeks ago that the Minister for National Security will be in charge of A, B, C, and D. Defense is also in charge of this. And this also appears like the, the senior minister position. In, in a way, it's like a coordinator of the uh, ministries that are in charge of security. We look at interior. Interior is mainly interested in national domestic security. Defense is more about external affairs, external aggression, etc. But now we have another ministry or let's say another minister whose job is to coordinate to ensure that the agencies under the Ministry of Defense, the agencies under the Ministry of Interior, they function in such a way that we see these agencies as uh, functioning consistent with modern ways of doing things. So human rights issues are going to be very, very important. And I think that if all of you are in the government and you understand that this is the vision of the President of the Republic, I don't see why there will be tough wars or overlaps, etc. Will a national security uh, minister make uh, any difference our security? Will it make it any better? I, th I think it will do because, as I said, we live in a more dangerous world now. And if you have an agency that will ensure that even in the midst of the challenges we face internally and externally, we are going to ensure that our, our intelligence agencies, our security agencies, they function based on acceptable ways of doing things based on best practices. I think Ghana will, end, will, will be able to get to the committee of countries and say that, look at what we are able to do. The security agencies, we know some of the things that happen. Don't, how many times don't we hear the police have beaten someone, they, uh, they arrested a driver, the soldiers were doing this and someone was beaten, etc. Now we have someone who can be held accountable. So it's the job of the National Security Minister, apart from every other thing, to ensure that human rights issues are prominent, they are prioritized in the activities of the security agencies. Well, we wish them well, and we hope that uh, because expectations are high, you know, trust no, me. No, I think expectations are very, very high. For many Ghanaians, let's look at the margin of victory. We've, we, we've never had a president losing election before in the Republic. Now, a president lost, and the way the loss was like so massive, very huge, it was like no contest. So Ghanaians are expecting a lot. And it was good the president even said every project they are going to ensure value for money so that the Ghanaian people will benefit. I know there are people who are waiting for training colleges to be given the allowances so that they can also go there. Exactly. People are waiting for the one district, one factory. People are waiting for the one million cities to go, one million dollars to go to the constituencies. constituencies and one district, and, and one they can do that, and all uh, of that. Uh, yeah, and so they have no time. And, and interestingly, I think that's why the Ministry for Monitoring and Evaluation is important. Very, very important. It needs to monitor all of these things at Make every Make sure stage. that we are getting value for money. Those who are in charge of implementation in the various districts at, or constituencies, how are they doing it? And when we can do that very well, the key thing is that poverty levels will come down. And rural urban migration is also will, going to reduce, reduce significantly. Well, people may end up getting something to do in the district. And they may not bother coming to the yeah. urban And when uh, you are there, you can save a lot of your to money. To look for yeah. jobs. Of, yeah. of yeah. course, <laughs> I don't envy their position. Where the NPP government finds itself now is not an enviable but, but position But I think the good all. thing for them is that when, <laughs> when expectations are very high, and you can also rise to the occasion. Exactly. Dr. Manson says something that... Uh, I think you even said Ghanaians are impatient. Yes. When they see you are doing something good, they are going to reward you. Reward we don't you. expect the MPP to change the fundamentals of our economy overnight. But we expect that we will be seeing some signs that, oh, some of the districts or constituencies, the factories have started. The training colleges, they've started receiving something. The taxes uh, reductions have come and, and more employment opportunities are being created. And once you can do that, people understand that. We live in a very difficult situation. Well, many thanks to you, Dr. Bosman. Very Asai. We're grateful mm. for your time, and we wish the NPP government well. We're watching, and we'll be updating on all the things that the NPP government will be doing. This is CM Express. Join us also on Monday. We'll be here doing it all over again. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Enjoy the rest of our programs.